This is a video for those of you who are looking to buy a new bike or wishing you could. Let me get one thing out of the way up front. New bikes are awesome and bikes are better now than they've ever been. But does it matter? So this is a half ramp, half expose at the bike industry, YouTubers, and all of us who've ever tried to give any advice. My goal isn't to tell you they should or shouldn't buy a new bike, but rather give you the framework of tools necessary to make a competent, informed decision before you go out and spend thousands of dollars on a new bike. So your time is valuable, let's dive in. Number one, the bike industry is set up to get you to spend as much money as possible. Now, before you say no shit, let me explain. I'll let you make your own guesses as to why, but the bike industry has effectively raised the cost of the cheapest bikes they sell. If you're here as an aspiring triathlete looking to get a tri bike, good luck. So the average entry level tri bike is now so upmarket that what we're calling entry level is really mid upper premium. The major bike brands don't have an entry level bike. Uh, so for a little perspective, let's look at the bike that Dave Scott rode to multiple nine hour Ironmans. You could actually go buy a Dave Scott Ironman Centurion. It was a steel lugged frame equipped for, with uh, Shimano 105 and sold for 520 US dollars. But Justin, you forgot about inflation. $1,143 of today's money, a Dave Scott branded Ironman Centurion. Here's the cheapest tri bikes that you can get right now from the major brands. Of course, you can cobble together a road bike with clip-ons, but we're talking like existing brands. These are the prices that you're paying for an entry-level triathlon bike when you're just trying to get into the sport. So before you accuse me of saying that I just don't understand the economies of scale of triathlon bikes, that's not the point. The, and the point isn't even to say uh, that bikes are overpriced. It's just that all bikes are so high-end right now. We've moved the entire market so much up that the basic bike that a lot of you are getting is a carbon Shimano 105 at a minimum, probably even Ultegra equipped bike. That's not an entry level bike, it's just the cheapest you can buy. Let me make one thing clear. Assuming the bike fits you, most people might as well just pick your next bike based off the color you like the most. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. Number two, most people don't have a clue about bikes and the bike industry uses that to their advantage. Here's an example that I have personally experienced multiple times. You tell me if you've seen it. Hey, I've been thinking about getting one of those felt IAs. Do you like it? Hey, yeah, sure, thanks for asking. No, it's the new felt IA. It's, it's a really good bike. Uh, saddle's super comfortable. It's way faster than my old road bike, that's for sure. Uh, my old bike hurt my back a lot, but this one's super comfortable. I really like it, you should get it. Yeah, that makes sense. What made you get this one versus like the new Canyons or Specialized or anything like that? Yeah, so like specifically versus other bikes that I looked at, like I said, the saddle's really comfortable. Um, it's got brakes, which is good. Uh, the shifters, you know, my old bike didn't shift very well, but this one, it's super fast. It's just a really good bike. You should definitely get this one. I really like it. And here's the important thing. I'm not knocking people who say those things. I have said those things, but when you start to unpack it, those aren't really the bike because what exactly does a bike manufacturer do? They're responsible for making the frame zero to a few of the components built on the bike and then the overall selection of components that are put on the bike in the final assembly. So let's unpack. When people say that a new bike is more comfortable than their old bike, what that means is that the fit is different and presumably better. It's great that the bike fits them better now, but that's a consequence of the frame sizing and geometry, not necessarily that this frame is better. When people say that it's a fast bike, th the differences between the very fastest hyperbikes and a more standard triathlon bike based off of frame drag is just a few watts, which is undetectable by feel. The new bike brakes and shifts better. Again, that's componentry and probably poor maintenance on the old bike because triathletes are not known for being great mechanics. The fact that you're looking at a bike with Ultegra from one brand doesn't make any difference compared to a bike with Ultegra from another brand. Number three thing that you need to know, bike reviews are kind of bullshit right now. The only thing I've nerded out about longer than bikes in my life is photography. To better illustrate this point, I'm gonna steal something that I see in photography reviews all the time. People will come in with this brand new $3,000 lens and unbox it and take a couple of photos and they'll just do a quick few snapshots and they're like, oh man, it's so fast, it's so sharp, it works so well. And now we're on the computer and oh yeah, it's a super sharp lens, 10 out of 10, you should definitely buy it using my Amazon affiliate link in the description below. So let me refer you back to point number one, which is that bikes are becoming super high-end across the board. 
Do you see where this is going? Most bikes are so good, it's hard to properly review a bike. What are you gonna say about it that the average person can garner meaningful information from? Like, it's not useful for me to say, all new bikes are basically really good, just go spend three grand and you'll love what you get. People wanna be reassured that what they're buying is a good decision. You've watched YouTube videos because you've searched for something before you've uh, bought it, and then they say good things and you're happy to hear that. We seek affirmation and surface level reviews satisfy that. I highly recommend you watch a TED talk called The Paradox of Choice. It's linked in the description. The super short version is, when there are a few choices, we take what we can get and we deal with it. When there's a lot of choice, our expectation of quality goes up so high that if something isn't perfect, we're upset. And then, because there were so many choices, we assume that we made the wrong choice and then we internalize the blame and, and essentially blame ourselves for making the wrong choice. So my point is that most bikes are super good. So most reviews are gonna say things about it that are just generally good in nature. And then you get into the arrangements when reviews have monetary or relationship incentive to say good things. If convincing people to buy a product directly puts money into your pocket, aren't you more likely to say good things? If your magazine or website has a relationship with a company that gets you early access to gear for reviews, are you gonna say that a product is categorically bad? Or are you just gonna to try to balance the negatives with the positives and come across fair and balanced? And full disclosure, many of the links that are in my video description are affiliate links. And I absolutely think that writers and reviewers and creators should be paid for the effort that they put in. But the crux for you as a viewer is you have to trust that the person you're watching has enough integrity to be honest in their assessment. Number four, the claims that bike brands make are sometimes questionable or don't really matter. So for how many years have you heard that bikes are getting stiffer, lighter, faster, better? Like at this point, if a bike doesn't even have a motor in it, I'm practically expected to be a disappointment. So let me be clear, maybe I'm just generous, but if a major brand says that a frame is, you know, this much percent better than last year, I tend to believe them. I tend to assume they're not just making up numbers, but numbers don't tell the whole story. Just because something's an improvement, doesn't mean it's even good or that every engineer or brand is perfect. Super quick example, my road bike, a 2011 Scott, specifically touted how compliant the rear carbon is. Uh, frame comfort was a huge deal in their marketing. They had the numbers to back it up. But you know how to make a bike actually comfortable? Bigger tires, lower pressures. But in making my rear triangle compliant, they also made it so that I can't fit a rear tire larger than a 23. Moving up to more modern comparisons, let's look at aero bikes. You see the felt IA right there with its wide, flat, three to one tubes, aero sculpting, and you expect a massive difference, and it's just not really there. These bikes are not meaningfully faster than their counterparts in a way that matters to the vast majority of you. Let me be blunt and say that if it's any sort of consideration to you about saving three minutes over a four and a half hour Ironman, bike ride, then this video was not meant for you. Those of you who are truly on the verge of qualifying or not for a Kona spot or a pro payout, stop listening to me, go to your local independent bike fitter and work with them to find a bike that, you know, optimizes for your body and optimizes the total system to give you the best outcome. Everybody else, I know you want a fast bike. We all do. But my point is, Going from something like Continental Gator Skins to Continental GP5000s is going to save you more watts on the bike than going from the absolute fastest hyperbike to the slowest modern triathlon bike. That's the difference here. It's really small and people need to be aware of what the differences are rather than thinking that a bike like that is going to somehow turn you into Sebastian Keenley because it's not. And number five, what you need to know, the non-bullshit, the stuff that matters, it exists, but it's boring. Here's the part of the video where if you comment, so you're saying all bikes are the same, I'm gonna link you to this right here. Let me be really clear, not all bikes are the same. Not all brands are equally good. No, you shouldn't just buy a bike based off its color. And yes, there are tangible differences that make some bikes way better overall and some bikes better for the specific buyer that's purchasing it. But the differences are hard to explain because they're not sexy. They're not immediately conveyable to new buyers like test riding disc brakes for the first time or immediately finding the new saddle more comfortable. What are those differences? A few of them, not all of them, are frame geometry, both in terms of how the bike fits you and the potential for 
uh, future adjustment as your flexibility changes for the better or worse. Frame geometry in terms of how the bike handles when set up in your position. Is the steering slow or fast? Does it, is it twitchy? Is it not? What do you prefer? How does it handle in crosswind versus another bike in the same setup? Is the bottom bracket well made so that it doesn't quickly develop a permanent squeak? A very commonly overlooked one for triathletes is ease of assembly and disassembly. More so than road bikes, tri bikes routinely get boxed and shipped to races, and some brands have made notoriously difficult design choices that make building your bike in your hotel room way harder than it should have been. Another good one that you should pay attention to is the quality of OEM componentry like bento boxes and brakes, as well as the amount of proprietary pieces on the bike in general. The storage box on my IA is held together with tape because I haven't bought the $70 version 2.0 that actually stays closed. Call me paranoid, I'm leery of race bikes that have a lot of specialized parts. If something breaks on my road bike, whatever, I miss a group ride. If something breaks on my tri bike before a race and I'm in the middle of nowhere and now I can't get apart, that whole bike's reason for being is gone. So I know that was a lot and you might be asking, so what? Here's the point. The good news is right now it's hard to make a bad choice. The worst bikes that you can buy from a major brand are better in a lot of ways than ones that won legit world championships a decade or two ago. But at the same time, I wanna draw attention to the fact and I'm gonna use my platform to do it, then in a sport that already fetishizes the purchases of more and more expensive equipment, you should not feel pressured to spend all this money if you don't want to. When it's time for you to buy your next road bike, I want you to prioritize fit and geometry and all of the other boring features that actually make up bike ownership above the fact that it's another pound lighter or it has a super comfortable saddle out of the box. Work with an independent bike fitter. Expect more out of reviews than a bunch of people listing off specs and telling you that, yes, shockingly, this $9,000 bike rides well. I want to dispel the myth that it's all about the bike, and that if you haven't spent thousands of dollars, you haven't earned the right to show up to the starting line. I want as many people as possible in this sport, and getting people into the sport with bikes they can afford quickly is good for all of us. Get the bike you can afford, makes you happy, and it's something you love to ride. Right now, in my spare time, I'm restoring my 1971 Schwinn Suburban, and I gotta say, I genuinely love that bike more than my Scott. If you're happy with it, that's what matters. If you like this video, let me know. If you don't, I'm sure you will too. Bye.